Welcome everyone. We'll begin in just a moment. I'm going to give everyone some time to get in. But as you enter, go ahead and share your name, organization, your role within that organization, and where you're joining us from. Welcome, Matthew. Lovely to see you from Colorado. Thank you for joining us. Say hi, Amy. Welcome. All right, everyone, welcome to our MDSS webinar series. I am Kyla Quorum, Marketing Events Manager here at Aperture Education. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today as we learn together. Before we begin, let's go over some housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded and everyone will receive a copy of the recording at the end of the presentation to review or share with your colleagues. If you're having trouble seeing the screen, you should first exit full screen view. If you still can't see the slides, you can double click on the small box at the top middle of your screen and it should bring up the slide deck. You should also see four functions at the bottom of the screen. We will utilize the chat box throughout today's session. The chat box can be used to provide answers to Lisa's questions and engage with each other. We are using the Q&A feature for all questions. Please add any questions to the Q&A box, not the chat. We will answer all of the questions at the end of the presentation. Why don't we give the chat box a try? Please let us know your name, district, and organization, and job title if you haven't already. We are also using the polling feature throughout today's presentation. Let's give that a try. We are attending several conferences this year, and we would love to know which ones you are also attending. So you should see a poll pop up on your screen. Please let us know which conferences you are attending, and hopefully we can connect with you on the road. Wonderful, the Southeastern School Behavior. We, we have that coming up, I think, tomorrow. That's wonderful. Urban Assembly Symposium, that's great. We're getting lots of good results coming in. I'm going to give everyone just a few more seconds, and then I'll share the results so you know what that will look like on your end when Lisa gets to that portion of her presentation. Great. All right. So we kind of got a, a big spread, but ASCA, I'm so excited. I will be at ASCA, as will, I believe, Lisa. So stop by our booth, say hello, and uh, send me an email. Let me know, and we'd love to try to meet up with you guys. Closed captioning is also available, and you can toggle that on or off at your discretion. And finally, the raise hand function. This feature can be used if there are any tech issues. If you raise your hand, I will send you a private chat to address any issues. Leading our webinar today is Dr. Lisa McCoo. Dr. McCoo is a partnership manager at Aperture Education and comes to us today with a wealth of expertise from several different roles within the education space. Lisa, welcome, take it away. Thank you all so very much for taking time out of your busy schedules to join me for today's discussion. My name is Dr. Lisa McCoo, and I'm excited to dig into this topic with you today. As way of introduction, I'm a nationally certified school psychologist, having partnered with students, staff, administrators, and district leaders for over two decades. For the last five years, I served as the district level social emotional learning specialist for a large division in Virginia, implementing comprehensive SEL programming including SEL assessment at 29 out of our 39 elementary schools and all of our 12 middle schools. I also serve as an adjunct associate professor at the School of Professional and Continuing Studies at the University of Richmond, supporting, teaching, and coaching teachers working toward their masters of education. Additionally, I proudly serve as a leadership team member for SEL for Virginia, having been one of a beautiful group of founding members of our ongoing community of practice. 
My current role as partnership manager at Aperture Education allows me to connect with school leaders across the country, helping others to use good data to problem solve and to support students in the most effective way possible. However, my most important role is as a mom to three beautiful children attending public school education. So today's topic, as well as the rest of the webinar series is both a professional and personal passion for me. I have a significant stake in the game, as you all do. So let's learn together. Today, we're gonna focus on painting a picture, a picture of decision-making, using what we know, how we know it, and what we ultimately wanna see to help us more objectively reflect on the impact of the pandemic in order to make intentional data-driven decisions about our resources and how we support our students. So our goals today are to explore learning loss in context pre and post pandemic. Analyze how an MTSS framework can support problem identification and subsequent allocation of resources. And finally, to reflect on the importance of SEL and sound SEL data to support student success. But first, let's take some time to build an initial picture in our minds. Imagine, if you will, an ideal school culture and climate where your students and your educators know for certain that they are successful. Now, if you're comfortable, take a moment and just close your eyes as I read these questions to you. And I want you to try to picture in your mind what each scenario would look like, sound like, and feel like. You ready? Arriving at school or office in the morning, how would you like to feel about coming to work as a member of the staff? How would students feel walking into your school buildings? What kinds of interactions would you want to have with your colleagues, with students that would help you feel this way? And what kinds of interactions would students have with each other to help them feel that way? How would you know that your voice was valued? How would students know that their voice was valued? What would success look like for you, for your students? How would you know you achieved success? What would that ideal school culture look like, sound like, and feel like? Just think. Now that you've painted that picture in your mind, let's capture that thinking. For this activity, we'll be using Jamboard. Kyla is gonna put that link in the chat. I want you to take some time to document what that ideal culture looks like, sounds like, and feels like. However, I want you to take it a step further to identify what would need to be in place for that ideal to happen. So let's take a moment and explore. So as you access this Jamboard, what you'll notice is that there are three slides at the top. And each slide has a unique question. On this first slide, the question is, what would an ideal school culture and climate look like for students and staff? And what would we be doing for this to happen? So your job is to think about what your response would be and to grab a post-it. If your answer focuses solely on students, use, uh, don't use my notes, Focus on using that sticky note over here. <laughs> there you go, thank you. And pick a yellow for students. If your response focuses solely on staff, toggle to green. If it can apply to both, toggle to blue. 
Once you write on the sticky note, save and it'll pop right up onto the slide. And let me just give you an example. If, let's say, you might see students using their social emotional skills to resolve conflicts because we would have explicit SEL instruction to teach this skill. So what would you see and what would we be doing for this to happen? And again, you're welcome to use the sticky note on the left-hand side. As you're ready, you can toggle right to the next slide, which is sound like, what would it sound like? And the third slide, what would it feel like? So I'm gonna give you about three minutes. I'm gonna set a timer and then we'll see where we land. Hopefully you had some really good, a good time to really think about what that looked like and what it sounded like, what it felt like. So I want us to really take those thoughts that we had and keep those in our mind. So looking back over the last three years, if you only based your knowledge of the pandemic impact on what you read in headlines, things would be really, really grim. There's no shortage of information about how the pandemic has negatively impacted student achievement in particular and education generally. If you had to write your own headline about the experience post-pandemic for your educators and students, what would it center on? 
take a moment and think. Given my own experiences and conversations I've had with district leaders and with friends who are educators, districts are addressing at least three, if not more, major priorities post-pandemic. First and foremost, they're responding to the learning loss they're seeing from students. However, many are jumping to the question of how to fix it without taking time to really dig into all of the possible reasons why students didn't receive or show an optimal response to instruction, besides the obvious tech reasons, such as lack of access to technology or the internet. Most teachers actually had minimal experience teaching in a remote environment. Many teachers told me it was like reliving year one of teaching. Even I had to figure it out all over again, teaching master's level teachers at U of R. However, even teachers who did feel confident during remote instruction, reported that students often didn't engage and actively participate. They refused to turn on their cameras. Why would that be? Why do you oftentimes turn your camera off during Zoom meetings? Let's take a moment and think. Secondly, schools are responding to overwhelming mental health needs they're seeing in students. They're trying their best to put resources in place to react to students who rise to the top, but there aren't enough people, time, and resources to react quickly enough. Students seem to be lacking pro-social skills to be able to tap into their own resilience. And ask anyone with school climate data, students are feeling disconnected from school. Finally, schools and districts are seeing teachers leave the profession and they're struggling to find ways to retain highly qualified educators. Teachers did not necessarily feel empowered to support students who needed more, and now there are more students who need more. Teachers felt like their social emotional needs were not being met. I'm sure there are other areas that have taken priority post pandemic. Let's take a moment to reflect and respond. What has your district prioritized post pandemic? Kyla's going to post a Zoom poll and let's just see where we stand. There's a lot of, of variety in these answers, and I really appreciate that honesty and transparency. It looks like for the most part, we're either looking at all of those priorities or we're really focusing on learning loss. Thank you so much for, again, your transparency and honesty. Now with each of these priorities, one of the common denominators is that districts are just in need. And because they're in need, they're unfortunately finding themselves in the position of putting band-aids on gaping wounds and scrambling to find solutions. Unfortunately, when we jump to solutions, we oftentimes find ourselves in the position of implementing strategies that don't actually solve the problem in front of us or we choose solutions that don't work well together and still don't solve our problem, causing us to waste a lot of very precious resources, time, money, and people. Throughout this webinar series, we'll touch on each of these priorities in varying degrees. Today, we're gonna to focus our time on achievement and learning loss. Gaps in achievement and students feeling disconnected did not suddenly appear during the pandemic. Existing learning gaps widened during the pandemic, spotlighting problems that already existed. What I continually hear from policymakers is that there's a need for more instruction. In fact, there are no shortage of webinars on academic tools and strategies to catch kids up academically. But what do students say as their reason for not engaging? Let's start by actually taking a closer look at what we're really talking about in terms of pandemic outcomes. What oftentimes gets highlighted in the data that's reported is the obvious decline in national performance scores post-pandemic 
creating a false causality that the pandemic and only the pandemic caused learning loss. Now, I'm not saying we didn't see a decline in performance. What I'm saying is, is this the whole picture? One of the things I have noticed from the NAEP data over time is the plateau that seems to have occurred over the last 10 years prior to the pandemic. This to me is quite interesting. What does this tell us about how students were performing before the pandemic? Well, let's take a look. This chart shows that performance in reading and math between 2009 and 2019, whoops, give me just a second, remained stagnant or decreased for students generally, and especially for students performing at or below the 50th percentile. So what happened in education between 2009 and 2019 to keep a stagnant or decline in performance? We know that No Child Left Behind was put into effect starting in 2002 which scaled up the federal role in holding schools accountable for student outcomes. Initially, this seemed like it made a lot of sense. Who would wanna leave children behind? States were tasked with bringing all students to the proficient level on state tests by the 13-14 school year. Although there was some variability in just what proficiency looked like and which tests to use. Nonetheless, our ultimate focus changed. Accountability and high stakes testing became the priority. Let's take a look at that progress prior to the pandemic for each of those content areas. In terms of reading performance, NAEP data indicated that fourth, eighth, and 12th graders showed a decline or no growth in reading performance between the two assessment periods. And really only about a third of assessed students were scoring at or above proficient. Similar results were seen in math performance. There was no measurable difference in performance for fourth, eighth, or 12th graders. Again, similar performance in science. Now there are many possible reasons for this. However, I wanna, want, I wanna look at one possible reason in particular, and that is student perception of and engagement in school. In a nationwide survey conducted by the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence and the Yale Child Study Center prior to the pandemic, they found that nearly 75% of polled high school students self-reported feeling negative about school. In fact, the three most common feelings used to describe how they felt about school was stressed, tired, and bored. This was the state of our engagement prior to the pandemic. Now think for a moment, if I have to go to a place day after day and come away feeling stressed, tired, and bored, how might that impact my social emotional well-being? Well, let's take a look at student mental health. According to data in 2021 from the Centers for Disease Control, more than a third, 37% of high school students reported they experienced poor mental health during the COVID-19 pandemic. And 44% reported they persistently felt sad or hopeless during, that past, during this past year. However, as our NAEP data showed us, this was not a new post-pandemic phenomenon. Data from 2009, 2019, what you're seeing on the screen now, 10 years prior to the pandemic, showed that high school students were demonstrating an increase in poor mental health outcomes. This is not a new phenomenon that arose from the pandemic. Again, the pandemic just shined a light on what was already happening. Now, students felt stressed, tired, and bored about school prior to the pandemic and were already showing an increase in mental health issues. Now imagine, imagine how they feel after adding in up to two years of isolation, stress, and uncertainty. How kids feel at school and whether they have the social and emotional skills to manage those feelings can significantly impact their performance and their overall health and well being. Now, for all my improvement science friends out there, this is gonna sound familiar. Problems are typically the result of a complex system and won't be solved by a simple solution because it's likely not the result of a single cause. If we jump in and throw fixes at a problem that we don't really fully understand, we end up wasting a lot of resources, 
time, people, and money. So how do you make good decisions in order to allocate those resources in the most effective and efficient way possible? Well, this is where MTSS comes in. MTSS requires us to use strong data to accurately and effectively identify the need that exists in order to efficiently intervene with evidence-based and research-based practices that address that need while also putting into place systems to support our educators to implement practices with integrity and our school leaders to accurately determine the impact of our efforts as good stewards of our fiscal resources. Well, let's take a look at this framework and walk through the questions you would address at each step. As we go, I want you to keep in mind the district priorities you identified earlier. Your guiding question is, do you have a complete whole child picture of the problem we're facing? At a high level, what we're looking at is data, practices, systems, and outcomes. At the very beginning of any problem identification process, we have to start with sound, reliable data that's going to help us explore and dig deeply into the problem that's in front of us. So our first question is, is our data showing that there's a need? Now, there are many data sources we can use to determine this, whether it's screening data for social-emotional competence, behavior referral data, or even student surveys to gauge student perceptions about climate and culture. The more challenging question that requires a bit more digging is what is the need that I'm seeing? This requires psychometrically sound data that is gonna allow us to drill down and reliably determine where that need is and for whom and under what circumstances. For example, maybe students aren't demonstrating mastery on academic standards. That is a symptom of a problem. Do we know who it's a need for? In what context? Can we stand behind the data we have to drill down reliably? But even more deeply, why is it a need? What is driving that need? Is it due to lack of instruction? How do you know? Are we sure our curricula is implemented with integrity? How do you know? Are our students engaged in the instructional process? How do you know? Is it because our educators need time to build their social emotional competence to become better models for students? And how do you know? Before we jump to looking at practices that we're going to put in place to fix the problem, we must have a reliable picture of what the problem is and why it's occurring. This is a crucial part of the problem solving process. In fact, this is the determining factor of whether we will use our resources in the most effective and efficient way possible. This component of MTSS requires a comprehensive picture of the whole child, academically, behaviorally, and socially emotionally. It requires psychometrically sound data that will help us to effectively and efficiently identify the need that we have so that we can proactively support students while using our resources, again, in the most effective and fiscally sound way possible. So take a moment and think, what data is your organization using to determine a need? Take a moment and think. Now, how confident do you feel that you have a full and complete picture of the problem? Kyla is gonna put a poll on the screen and let's see how confident our audience feels. I so appreciate your transparency. We have people that are just trying to figure it out. We got a good direction, maybe not sure. We might be good, might need to take a second look. I really appreciate your willingness to share your experience with us. 
In our next webinar, we're going to explore different types of school data and the questions we can answer using that data. But keep in mind, we all believe in supporting the whole child. However, if we only base our decisions about our scarce and precious resources on one source of data, such as academic data or behavior and discipline data, we're still missing a piece of the puzzle. Remember how high school students felt about school? How I feel about school is a symptom, but it connects to my social emotional well-being generally. More specifically, it's an indicator of whether I have the social emotional skills I need to be engaged and empowered to make a change. So if your students are telling you that they feel disconnected from school, it may be time to take a harder look at whether they have the social emotional skills they need to be successful and whether we're giving educators intentional time to foster those skills in students. Once we have done the difficult but most important job of identifying what our problem is, then and only then do we identify what are we gonna put into place to meet that need and why do we think this practice will work? What do we know about how this practice could impact the driving force behind our need? Our decisions at this point in the MTSS process should be based on data-driven hypotheses about why we think the problem is occurring and what evidence-based and research-based practices are available to us. Now that we have identified our need and the practices we're going to use to address that need, what do we as implementers need to ensure that those practices are implemented consistently and with integrity? This most likely will include specific action steps, a communication plan, materials and resources, and professional development. Bottom line, what supports are needed? Now, one of the best supports that administrators can give to educators is time. Intentional time to build their professional, social, emotional competence. In this way, educators are better equipped to understand what those social emotional skills look like for themselves and for students in real time. This then allows them to better model those competencies for students, which can ultimately positively impact relationships, environment and culture, and skill building and generalization for students, all of which may be hypotheses about why you're seeing a need in your school. All of this data-driven decision-making actually really makes very means very little without having a goal to aim for. So what is our intended outcome? What do we hope to see in our data? And how do we know it's working? What is the impact? The only way that we can be confident in the outcomes we hope to see is by having psychometrically sound data that's reliable and valid for the specific purpose we are using it for. Can the data we have tell us whether the growth that we are seeing is both significant and meaningful? Sometimes we have data that shows movement, but depending on the rigor of the data, we might not be able to tell whether that growth is meaningful. Bottom line, is it enough growth? Are we actually moving the needle? And finally, how do we know that we are implementing our practices consistently and effectively? This speaks to integrity of implementation. If we're not seeing the impact that we expect to see, a crucial decision point will be to examine whether our practices are in place the way we think they are. Now, this is oftentimes apparent if there are discrepancies when we're looking across data points. When the data doesn't make sense, we may need to revisit our systems and supports we have in place that support the people who are doing the work. So based on our current information, what do we know? We know that academic NAEP data indicated that student academic progress was plateauing and then declined. Why? Again, there are probably a multitude of reasons, but one thing is certain. Students told us that school was not engaging. So how do we re-engage students? We re-engage students 
with practices that focus on building students' social emotional strengths and helping them to use those strengths to be partners with us in education. All human beings learn best in communities where their basic and psychological needs are met. According to early work done by Maslow, we all have basic and psychological needs that when met, help us to reach our fullest potential. So I wanna zoom in on those psychological needs because the later work of DC and Ryan help to illuminate what those psychological needs are for us and also help us to understand why fostering social and emotional skills is such a crucial flagstone to being able to reach our fullest selves. We are truly engaged, motivated, and empowered when we have autonomy or voice and choice, otherwise known as agency, when we feel like we belong to a community where we can connect and relate effectively and productively with others. And also when we feel like we are competent or self-efficacious in the skills that we're being asked to demonstrate. So it's time to bring this full circle. At the beginning of our session today, I asked you to reflect on what an ideal school culture looked like, sounded like, and felt like. We then took some time to explore the academic data and student well being data leading up to and following the pandemic. We did a high level walkthrough of the MTSS decision making framework and zoomed in on one possible hypothesis about why we are seeing the outcomes that we're seeing. Well, now let's return to our Jamboard. While I'm presenting here, feel free to look at those responses. I want you to think back to that ideal school culture and climate picture that you imagined and then described. Did your ideal school culture include students and staff feeling connected to others in positive relationships? Did it sound like students and staff having a voice and choice in their growth? Did it feel like students and staff demonstrating competence, mastery of the skills they need to be successful? Compare your responses to what we know about meeting our psychological needs, but also, I want you to think about how that ideal school culture most likely relies on us as educators, knowing and fostering social and emotional strengths within ourselves and within our students. When we start with strengths, we end up stronger in every possible way. Now I wanna introduce you to Krista Pomeroy and Marcy Warner from Bernie ISD in Bernie, Texas, just outside San Antonio. Marcy is the Student Support Counselor and Behavior MTSS Coordinator for Bernie. And like me, she also has a stake in the education game, not only for K-12 students, but also to foster skills in students to ensure that they are ready for college and career success. Her husband is an agricultural mechanics teacher in Bernie ISD. They have three sons. Her oldest is a remote pipeline control operator for Everline Energy. Her middle is a junior at Texas Tech University, majoring in agricultural communications. And her baby is a senior at Bernie High School, who will attend Universal Technical Institute for welding in the fall. And Krista is the Director of Student Support Services in Bernie ISD. With over 25 years in education, her passion is creating collaborative communities where students families and educators come together to create an environment that's encouraging, enriching, and engaging. Ms. Pomeroy graduated from Chapman University in Orange, California with a bachelor's in psychology. And after moving to Texas, she continued her studies at the University of Texas, San Antonio, earning a master's in counseling, followed by a master's in educational leadership from Concordia University. In addition to serving as an early childhood specialist, teacher, instructional coach, and assistant principal, she most recently served as a campus principal for 12 years. She's a principal advocacy fellow with Raise Your Hand Texas and a cohort member of the Raising Family Partnerships Harvard Graduate School of Education. Mrs. Pomeroy's family includes two boys, Eric and Jeremy, and her husband, Scott. 
With 12 schools and over 10,000 students, Bernie did exactly what we talked about today. They reflected on their data, practices, and systems, and realized that they were missing a piece of the puzzle. I can't wait for you to hear their story. Welcome, Christy, Krista and Marcy. Sorry. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So thank you so much for taking time out of your day to share your success with others. It's so nice to meet you. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about yourselves and your roles in Bernie. All right, well, as you mentioned, um, I am the Director of Student Support Services here in Bernie ISD, a new position for me. I, I transitioned from the campus to our central office, district office staff um, in January, and it's been a great transition. Um, although I miss being on the campus and being around the children day to day, I have opportunities to go and, and have those moments when I'm, I'm reconnecting. Um, but yes, I've, I've been a principal for many years. I've my heart is all around teaching and serving our students um, and advocating and meeting all of the individual needs of each and every student. And Marcy is my cohort member here. She is my partner and uh, provides a lot of the direct services. And just to all of the viewers, if I'm looking right, it's because she's in the same room with me and not because I'm <laughs> looking to dodge out the door, but she is here with me in my office. Um, and so Marcy, I'll, I'll hand it off to you. Um, so happy to be here. I have been um, student support counselor for three years. What's amazing about this job is not only do I have opportunity to work directly with um, some of our most at-risk students, I also get to work with campuses on building good systems and looking at the data and kind of growing the adults as well as the kids. Um, so I love my role here in Bernie ISD. Thank you so much. I am excited to, to ask this next question or really to ask you to talk about this, but I want you to paint us a picture of how you determined that there was a gap in your data over the last couple of years. Well, I'll take that question. Um, having served on, you know, at the campus level as a principal um, and having come to Bernie about five years ago um, from another district in San Antonio, uh, the first thing I realized is there was a gap in the data because there was no data. <laughs> we did not have data and we were making a lot of decisions um, associated with whether it was student behavior or um, around, um, you know, our academic development and, and progress within our students. It was very arbitrary. It was based on assumptions. It was very inconsistent across the district. And that came to light really when the pandemic hit um, and we were trying to make decisions. Bernie, we were one of the first school systems within the state of Texas to return to in-person learning. We were not virtual very long, um, but when we were virtual and when we were trying to meet the needs of our students, we realized we didn't have the information that we needed to maintain the services that maybe we had been providing. Um, but then additionally, it was very unique each campus um, across the board. So we learned very quickly our gaps were self-created that we needed to kind of um, create that consistency and to start those conversations around our progress monitoring, around being very intentional, a lot of the things you just talked about, having those questions and having answers to those questions based on data. So our gaps were self-created um, and we've just worked very, very hard um, to close those gaps based on systems that we've been creating. And I wanna to add to that too, um, what was interesting is we, all of our interventions when it comes to SEL and behavior, we're almost event-based or symptom-based. You know, the kids that are constantly in the counselor's office or because we had a, divo a divorce or a death in the family. So we're responding based on, like she said, assumptions and really around events that occur. When the pandemic hit, everyone had an event. Mm -hmm. And so how do you delineate and tier what services you provide um, based on need? And so it added to that need of we need to know root cause because some students do really well under pressure or stress or these events. 
and why do other kids not? Mm -hmm. And so we were realizing we need to know root cause. That's where the data came in. Um, so the pandemic actually um, helped us see overwhelmingly that we needed better data to give better interventions. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you so much for your transparency. Mm -hmm. So it sounded like really having that data really helped you to create that, that whole picture. So tell me, having social emotional competence data, mm -hmm. um, what problems did that allow you to solve? Um, definitely that, especially after the pandemic, everyone struggled with an event. So now how do we really get to root cause and what skills are students missing in order to intervene? Um, at tier one, what overall, like which is the skill that most kids struggle with, right? So what skills do we need to be teaching? What foundational skills? And then, uh, you know, data and assessments give us which skills are they struggling in? And we can really narrow to our instruction. It's very intentional. It's not arbitrary. Right. Um, if a student is uh, low in social awareness, we are going to give them social awareness skills. Um, and it also helped with parent conversations. Mm -hmm. So we're not attacking parents like your kid is bad or your kid is this or even an emotional level that your kid is struggling behaviorally. And as parents, they own their children's behavior. When you can say your child is lacking the skill they seem to be a little bit more at ease in taking that in. And it gives them the ability to say, I can help with that, right? And also as teachers and counselors and administrators, we can help parents on how they can help us at home. Um, it doesn't become overly emotional or um, I guess accusatory in a way. We're not saying it's your fault or our fault. It's kid, you know, the students lacking skills. Um, and so, which skills are they and how are we going to teach them? Is it going to be small group? Is it going to be individual? Is it going to be a combination of several things? What support services do they need so that they can be successful? Now, with that picture of that whole child data with your academic, your behavioral, and then I'm assuming with your DESA data um, to show those skills, how are your students doing now that you've been able to use data to put practices into place? Again, and I know it's not gonna be perfect, but how are your students doing, recovering academically, socially, and emotionally from the pandemic? So academically, um, we are back where we were at and exceeding where we were at prior to the pandemic. It's been very intentional, again, putting systems in place um, and being, um, very proactive in, in making these changes. One of the biggest pieces that we've seen success come through um, and, and kind of shine brighter mm -hmm. is around the SEL. So the conversations, when you start talking about whole child and, and SEL with the teachers and building that into your MTSS system, there's some reluctance, you know, there's, there's a little bit of a pushback and, and we had to change our practices and change our mindset. When we showed them that MTSS associated with behavior and SEL, when we showed them that it's skill-based, as Marcy was mentioning, it became very um, applicable in their classroom. It became very, um, easy for them to kind of embrace what we were telling them because we were giving them strategies. So I'll give you an example. When we were facilitating MTSS conversations around academics, the teachers were kind of embracing that. We were building goals. For example, if it was around reading, we can talk about like, what skill is the child missing? Is it, you know, associated with phonemic awareness? Is it comprehension? And we could build you know, a really great intervention plan around that. But when we would talk about behavior, they would have a much more difficult time having those conversations with us. You know, well, he won't, he's not complying. He's not doing his work. He's not, you know, whatever it was. When we would take the DESA data and we would show them, okay, let's look at this data. Let's see what the skill is that this student is missing. Is it on decision-making? Is it on personal responsibility? Is it on, you know, self-awareness, um, optimism, whatever it is, we could develop a goal and a plan and interventions and strategies. And so that the teacher could 
you know, intentionally work on that, just like they would work on a reading goal or a math goal, they would have those skills. And so what we're seeing with our data, you know, pre-pandemic to now, we are back, you know, academically exceeding or at where we were at before. Um, so we don't have those academic gaps, but what we're seeing behaviorally is that we are able to create classroom supports, individual supports, group supports that are working on skills. Our referrals have decreased, our be, you know, behavior strategies are much more purposeful. Um, and overall within our campuses, we're seeing greater success academically and behaviorally because we are being very intentional and basing everything on our skills. And to add to that, when she was talking about um, like the math goal, the reading goal, when we show teachers, well, they're non-compliant because they have a low uh, mm -hmm. skill in optimistic thinking. So they're not trying because they don't believe in themselves. Mm -hmm. And we can show the data. And the teachers kind of, I've seen light bulb moments where they're like, oh, okay. So in their math class, they're working with that student on optimistic thinking, the power of yet. Mm -hmm. You can do this. I believe you, you know, and they'll refer not only to their math goal, but to the optimistic thinking goal mm -hmm. in that same language. It's all interconnected. It's magical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that gives me goosebumps. Yeah. <laughs> I can hear the confidence from you in being able to have that data to be able to use your resources mm -hmm. very effectively and efficiently. Do you feel confident in the decisions that you're making? I, I think that we do. And, and what's even better, our teachers are feeling more confident. They're, they're understanding the why behind why some of these behaviors may exist in the classroom and that it's not kids intentionally trying to challenge you. And really our mindset is that we teach academics, we teach behavior, we teach social, emotional, you know, all of these things. It's part of our, our classroom and our culture now. And we've given the tools, we've given them kind of, again, kind of that root or that that reason for some of these behaviors. And then we can, as a team, as a group, as a, you know, a support system, we can engage the parents, the teachers, the counselors, the administration to better support the students and they feel successful. Just again, tying it back to academics, we have students measuring their goals and their progress in the classroom. Now we're giving them these goals to say like, we're gonna work on your decision-making and we're gonna celebrate and we're also going to give you strategies on experiencing those successful moments or leading to those successful moments. So having those, those connections, um, it does build confidence. It allows the teachers to feel more confident. It allows, most importantly, the students to feel more confident. Um, and we're seeing the success because of it. That's awesome. Well, Krista and Marcy, thank you both so very much for telling your story and for being a support for division leaders across the country. Thank All right. You for us. Thank you. Yes, thank thank you. you. I'm so excited you guys came. So now it's time for us to come to a close. So let's finish today with an optimistic closure. You've had time today to reflect on what your vision, what you want your vision to be for your students and for your staff. I've also given you a path filled with reflection, decision-making, and possible next steps to ensure that you are really seeing the entirety of the problem that lays before you. You got a chance to hear from some amazing district leaders who intentionally used that MTSS framework to take meaningful next steps to move forward from the pandemic. Well, now it's your turn. What is your next step? in addressing learning loss. Take a moment and think. If you feel comfortable, put something in the chat. Thank you so very much for your time today. Please don't hesitate to reach out to learn more about how Aperture and the DESA data can support your district. I've included resources for you to use to build your background knowledge and to reflect on your MTSS system. And finally, 
please join us next time as we dig into different data sources that districts use and how to understand what kind of data you can glean from that information and what questions you can answer. And now I'm gonna turn it back over to Kyla, see what questions we have. That was wonderful, Lisa and Krista and Marcy. Thank you all very, very much. Um, we do have a few questions in Q&A. I also want to drop in the chat box registration for our next webinar in this series, if you'd like to join us. Our first question comes from Catherine Cueva, and she would like to know, what do you do when team members may not be on the same page? I'm going to let my experts in the field right now answer that. I'm keeping my mouth shut. Well, I think that we experienced success when we were making this transition because we were very intentional in chunking the information. It was not pushed out as an immediate expectation. One thing that I feel like our district does really well, we call it chunk and chew. So we give you a little bit of information. We let you embrace it, get support around it, implement it, try it, get feedback. And then we give you a little bit more. And so really when we started to roll this out, knowing that everybody was coming off of the pandemic and kind of having their world rocked, um, we really brought the team in, explained what was gonna be coming from a big global perspective, um, but we didn't say we're doing this all at once. And we were very intentional in starting primarily with our elementary schools. Um, and we understood our kids are going to be moving through the system. And so if we build that foundation, you know, we will gradually get there and, and start to um, share the success. But we, we really mapped out a plan. And you know, the continuum of change is three to five years. And so we did not expect this to all just be blasted out and okay, this is what it is. Um, and even now, you know, like I said earlier, we, we never arrive. And so we, we face challenges. But when you have those people who are resistant, taking the time to have those conversations and find out, like, what is, what is stressing you out about this? Like, go through this productive struggle with us, like, come out on the other side and, and constantly having those touch points. I will say it's very important to keep your administrators, your principals on board, this is not an initiative. This is just best practice. This is what we do for kids very seamlessly and naturally around academics, but you're not going to be successful academically if you don't support the kids with the skills and strategies behaviorally and around their social emotional learning. You'll never get there academically. So letting them express their frustrations, their fears, whatever, um, and then just being very um, intentional in creating that scaffolding um, so that they're having that support all the way along. We check in with them all the time. We give them a safe space to like say this is awful and we don't like how this is going and this is why this isn't working. Um, and again, it's not a perfect system, um, but it's providing the support and being very, very quick to respond when you see the success, when you notice it and, and validate what they were feeling, but then saying, look how much you've grown. Um, and look how much progress you've made and look at these success stories with your individual students, but be there to support them um, and, and understand like it's, it's when we get things that we're just like, what in the world do we have to do now? What did you just add to my world? Um, empathize and then give them the tools and strategies. And if they're not on board and it's truly what your, your district vision is um, and they're not aligning with that vision, that's okay. We don't all, you know, have to share that same vision, but if you're strongly aligned with that direction, um, then, then maybe they're not the team member to be there and that's okay. There's, there's a place for them. That doesn't mean they're a bad person or they, but really we've had that mindset of it's not do or die, but we're going to do everything we can to coach you and support you and understand, um, and, and build capacity. So that's, that's really been our mindset around that. Wonderful answer. Marcy, did you want to add to that? Or are you good? Forgot we're sharing a microphone. I, sharing a microphone. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think one of the things Krista said is like when you roll it out slowly, what I think has been really cool is 
Like we started with our elementary schools and giving them the gift of time for morning meeting. It's built into their time schedule. It's a minute expectation, just like there's minutes expected for math instruction. Um, and then as we've grown, our secondary schools are like, wait, I want time. I want that. And so where we want them to go, they're asking to go, the majority. Uh, and so those, it, it helps kind of almost tier those teachers, right? Mm -hmm. So you have most of them are on board and then that coaching piece is vital and just individual conversations with teachers that aren't quite grasping and feeling like it's one more thing and helping them see it's not one more thing, it's intermixed with all of your things already. So coaching. Great, wonderful, wonderful answer. All right, our final one is also from Catherine. And she, I think this is to you, Marcy and Krista, but she is curious if you did the DESA extended assessment with your students, the full DESA. Oh, the full DESA, yes. yes. So um, we give all students the mini, which is our universal screener. So 100% of our students receive the universal screener. If they show a need for more instruction on the mini, those students are then given the full DESA. It's the full DESA data that we use to create our groups, individuals, and so forth. It's one piece of the puzzle. Um, we also, when a teacher is struggling or a student is struggling and say they scored typical on the screener, yet for some reason, they're just not doing well in class or in life, we actually have them complete a full DESA before we come together to look at all of their collective data. You know, what is, you know, we use the ACEs. So what is their ACEs score? What is their DESA score? What is their attendance? What is discipline? You know, all of the things. So we use the full DESA um, extensively for our mm -hmm. students. Great, well, all of us Aperture over here are saying, yes, great job. <laughs> That's like what we'd recommend. Uh, Krista, did you want to add to that at all? Um, no, I just, I know that sometimes people are like, wait, you give the full DESA? And so Marcy just explained that, but we've also, um, and that was, that was a piece that we had to build capacity around and understanding, and the teachers really value that data now. In fact, they're asking to have like the self-assessment pieces added and we're building in advisory times and things like that so that the students are doing the student assessment piece. And so they're seeking that information because it's become very valuable. So although it's a time commitment, um, the, the return on investment is huge. Um, and again, it's allowing those teachers to have a better understanding of their students um, and then to, to provide skill-based interventions or just interactions. It doesn't even have to be like, a, so we built this intervention for this child. It's just a better understanding and it's enhancing our interactions with our students. And I will say, if you use the data to um, address your climate and culture to skill deficits, if the data is used correctly, teachers will they won't complain or have a problem with actually giving you the data. It's when they give the data and then it just goes in a file. Right. You know, if that is happening, it's not good use of data. And so teachers aren't going to give it as much merit. Mm -hmm. So really valuing and using the data um, will help eliminate a lot of those uh, educators that are uh, resistant. Wonderful. Well, uh, Marcy and Krista and Lisa, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. Um, we are going to be sending a follow-up email to everyone who attended today with a copy of the presentation. That's been a popular question for you, Lisa, um, as well as a recording. So um, to all the attendees, thank you for taking the time today to be here with us. And thank you for everything you do for the education system. We hope you have a wonderful day. And Lisa, Marcy, and Krista, we appreciate your expertise and sharing your journey with us. Uh, we hope everyone has a wonderful week and a fabulous Wednesday. Bye, everyone. <laughs>